any of you'd like to go, if that's okay. We're doing a craft today. We're still not doing crafts in here. I announce that every week. We're not doing crafts today. All right. Luke, you're getting ready to go to Mexico, right? Yes, sir. Excited about that? I'm pumped. I bet you are. <laughs> you look like it, man. Oh, yeah. I'm ready to serve Jesus, baby. How's your Spanish? Muy pequeño. <laughs> say that again. Muy pequeño. All right. That's good. Right. What did you say? Very little. <laughs> I know that. <laughs> We're excited for you guys uh, to be heading down there. You ready? Yes, sir, I am. All right, let's bow our heads. Dear Lord, thank you for Mr. Gary. I ask that you be with him uh, as he gives us uh, a lesson on your word. And I ask that you open up all of our hearts to be able to take note of the words that he's going to say to us. And that we take it to our hearts. And more importantly, that we just take you to our hearts and that we can deepen our relationship with you and i also want to pray that you make us aware not with just sharks and whatnot but to stand up for anybody and just to be the one in jesus name i pray amen amen thank you luke know the guys up top like when i do that At least once or twice a year, I forget that, so I apologize. It is good to see you. Glad that you are here, all of our guests. Thank you for being with us today. Um, I hope you're having a good time down here on uh, the Emerald Coast, and I hope your vacation goes well. Uh, I was not going to get up here this morning and mention anything about a shark attack, but somebody beat me to that. (laughs) You know, I, here's the way I figured it, and I think outside the box, but after that happened was probably the safest time to go back to the water because the sheriff's department was out in boats patrolling the coast, and they might still be doing that somewhat, but I figured it's probably safer now to go in than, than what it was. But that is, to our guests, that, that is a very rare thing uh, to happen. So we're prayerful for those people who were involved, so grateful that Almighty God had the right people in the right place because not only did they have two guys there, two doctors, they also had some nurses that were trauma that were trained in trauma, and uh, were able to assist in saving that young lady's life. And I tell you what, you you can't read the story about her and all that happened without tears welling up in your eyes. So grateful to God. Um, for saving her life and, and the ones that he put in place there. So, happy Father's Day to all of our dads. No, we're not having a Father's Day sermon today. Sometimes I do that, sometimes I don't. But since Mother's Day comes before Father's Day, if I didn't do one on Mother's Day, there's no way I'm doing one on Father's Day. You can take that to the bank because then the mothers would be after me. So uh, we are grateful for our dads, for our fathers, and uh, we're, we're not going to go down that road today, but uh, it is a good time for us every year to reflect on, on our dads and what they mean to us. I have one announcement, and that is, uh, so next week, Rhonda won't be here. She'll be in Mexico. So she needs someone to fill in for Children's Church. If you would be interested in doing that, please let Rhonda know before I just get up here and appoint someone. You don't want me to do that. Anyway, uh, please let Rhonda know if you can fill in next week uh, for Children's Church. So the last uh, couple of weeks, we have been talking about a bigger story, bigger story than what we are, uh, reflecting on our study last year of the book, The Story, and, and hopefully helping us to realize, you know, it's a bigger world out there, and there's Uh, There's bigger things to think about than just our little area of the world. And I know I'm not trying to trivialize anything going on in your life right now. Not at all, because life has its ups and downs. Sometimes big things happen to us, things that bring us down. Sometimes there's great things that lift us up. Not trying to take that away whatsoever. But we need to look at this in the big story, in the big picture, And we see this in Ephesians, and 
I, I think it's written, the Apostle Paul's writing this basically to, to, to explain to them the plan of God, what Paul actually calls the mystery, the mystery. He wants them to see the big picture. And what we have looked at is also in this big picture is where he talks about unity. Unity of the saints. Unity for all of us. Did you know before today that God would love for us all to be united? Yes, you probably knew that because he does. From the very beginning throughout the Bible we see that. He wants us to be united. Now, that does not mean united in all of our thoughts and in all of our ways. Not like that at all. I like others to think differently than I do. I'm very appreciative of that. I don't like it uh, if we all, if, if, if we all, I, I wouldn't like it if we all just thought exactly alike. We're not going to do that. And that's good. That's healthy. But yet being united, being united in him, looking at the bigger picture. Yes, God would like us all to be united. So that's what we saw last week when we were looking at God's great plan to bring everything together in unity in Christ. So today what we're going to do is we're going to consider the place of love in that process. Do you like to love people? Loving on people, that's a good thing. I mean, you know, we should love people. Why is that? Because we're taught to love people. Bob just read a scripture a few minutes ago, talked about loving people. Now, it is very difficult to love some people. Some people, is so easy But some people, it's very difficult to love them. The doctors that helped the young lady on the beach the other day and and the other medics that were there to assist, you know, I I think about that and, and, and I don't know if they loved her or not. It didn't matter. They loved human life. They knew that they should do what they should do. And they did it. They got up. They took action. They didn't ask this young lady what her politics were. Now wait, before I help you putting this tourniquet on, are you a Democrat or Republican? That, are, are you an Alabama fan or an Auburn fan? <laughs> come on, this may, come on. No, no, no. It's not like that. You know, I I think most of us have this love for people that that we we help people regardless. If someone's going down 98 and they're going in and out of traffic and you're mad at them and then they crash, are we going to be happy about that? Well, don't answer that. I hope you're not happy about that. (laughs) And if you see they are injured, you know what you should do. You should help them. Now, you not, might not like them a whole lot right then because of driving dangerously and what they did. But you know what? We're still supposed to love people. We're still supposed to love people. No matter what, love people. So changing gears here just a little bit, but I'll bring it back around. We kind of live our lives in a, in a three-tiered universe of exist, existential reality. Level one, our inner circle, well, you know, that's my story there. That's my story. Where we all come together, we we, we try to write a small private script. We search for meaning. We search for power, prestige, possessions, whatever it might be. That's us. That's our little story right there. That's our story that things, you know, people might know about us. It's things that we might know about us, but we don't tell other people. It's, It's our own little world. That's us. Do you have your own little world? Well, sure you do. Do you have thoughts that maybe you don't tell other people, that you just keep to yourself? I know some of you don't. You think it, you say it. But in this own little world, 
is us, who we are. Hmm. We have another level there. That's then our story. Where we find an identity as, as part of a group or a tribe. It might include your ethnicity, your nationalism, or your religious faith. It might even include a favorite sports team. Yeah, we find identity there with others. These loyalties here kind of expand our, our, our sense of self and, and raise us above our le little egocentric uh, stories. It's not about just us, but we include other people. But it's not the whole story. Because then level three is in the story, God's story. It teaches us what life is really all about. God's story. So this morning we're going to read from Ephesians chapter 3. Verses 1 through 21. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ, of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is, the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I have already written briefly. In reading this, then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations, and is as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of His power. Although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery. I mentioned mystery again there. Interesting which for ages past was kept hidden in God, who created all things. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, according to His eternal purpose that He accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in Him and through Him, Excuse me, in him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and how long and how high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. The Apostle Paul said a mouthful there. We're going to break this down just a little bit. As you can see, Paul's writing from uh, prison. He's in Rome, waiting trial before Nero. The delay is for Jewish prosecutors to arrive from Jerusalem to, to press charges against him. What's the charge, you ask? Well, you know, he, he started a riot in Jerusalem. 
He started a riot. You can read more about that story in Acts chapter 22. See, he was making a speech on the steps of the temple. We see in Acts 22, verse 21. And they didn't much care for his speech. He said, and this comes from Acts 22. And the Lord said to me, go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. The crowd listened to Paul until he said this. Then then they raised their voices and shouted, rid the earth of him. He's not fit to live. Oh my. Oh my. So there you are, the Apostle Paul, and, 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 and you're, you're there giving a speech, and they don't like the speech a whole lot. And they start yelling out, you know, we need to get rid of this guy. He, he's not fit to live. But you say, well, what, what's the big deal? Well, these people couldn't accept the idea that God would have anything to do with a Gentile. There's no way God would have anything to do with a Gentile. No way. They were stuck in a level two story that believed God's love and God's plans were reserved for their tribe only. Only for them. Everybody else was excluded. The Pharisees taught that Gentiles were were, were, were useful only as fuel for the fires of hell. Gentiles were no good. How could an almighty God love us and still love them? No way. He loves us. Gentiles are our servants. That was their mindset. So imagine this. Imagine this. Just to kind of put another perspective on it. Imagine going to Mecca. Where all the Muslims are gathering together for their hajj. Imagine going there and announcing publicly that Muhammad had appeared to you and appointed you as a goodwill ambassador to to the Jews because he loves them too. Uh Uh-oh. That wouldn't go over very well. Kind of like what the Apostle Paul was experiencing. Hmm. So you can understand why it sparked a riot, which nearly got him killed. So Paul tells the Ephesians, who were primarily Gentiles, he says, you know what? I am here in prison for your sake. Because of you, I'm in jail. It's all about the mystery, as we see In verse 6 of Ephesians 3, this mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together, one body, sharers together in the promises in Christ Jesus. You know who these Gentiles are? They're us. Us. We've been brought into the family. Put it simply, Paul says the mystery I think here is is grace. God loves you completely and perfectly. Jesus is a proof. Jesus is the absolute proof. But it's not being exclusive. It's actually being inclusive. It's available to everyone. Yeah, I think about this and 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 we can look back in the first century and see their mistakes and Paul preaching to the Jews, or Paul preaching to the Gentiles. We can see where he's trying to bring unity, and he's letting them know, you know, that this is this is wrong. You might say, "Well, preacher, we don't have that problem today. We don't have that problem today." I think sometimes we do among different racial lines and ethnic lines and other lines. 
So these Jews were pretty angry. They thought they had a corner on God. They were chosen people living in a special city and exclusive access to God through the temple and through the, through the law. In other words, they were living exclusively in that second level story, our story. They're not only them, but their tribe. And Paul came along and said, you know what? None of your credentials count anymore. Now everyone gets in because of Jesus. Being born Jewish that doesn't gain you anything. Keeping the law doesn't gain you anything. Worshiping in the temple, that doesn't gain you anything. No more. Don't you think that had to be a little hard to take? So let me bring that a little closer to home for you, okay? Let's say you joined a country club. In this country club, you had to pay a million dollars to get in. And you do it. And you're in. You have been chosen. You are selected. You are in this country club. Million dollar initiation fee. You're there. You're there. And then all of a sudden, the next week, membership committee, they've dropped all these requirements and they ain't letting anybody in. Oh, no. But I'm special. Don't you realize I'm special? Because I paid a million dollars. Yeah. You're not special anymore. Well, I guess we're all special when, as Christians, as followers of Christ. But here, here in this country club, you're like everyone else. What was God's solution? Well, verses 10 and 12, our text this morning from Ephesians 3. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in him and through faith in him we may approach God with freedom and confidence. We know God's plan, that is to bring all things together in Jesus. And, and, and Paul is telling us now how he's going to do it, it's through the church. The church serves a couple of purposes here in, in God's plan. We're a demonstration plot for the breaking down of the walls of hatred and suspicion things that divide humanity. Church, we should be leading the way. We should be leading the way in, in, in showing people God's love. We're a staging ground to be for the release of the mighty power of God to draw people to himself. You know, first God created the universe and all of its beauty and splendor, and then he created human beings to live in this paradise. He granted us free will so, so our love would be real, not forced. He gave, us, he gave us His will. He allows us to love Him if we want to. He doesn't force it. But we as human beings, we, we kind of rebelled against that. We broke our love relationship with Him. But God had a plan, and in Christ, He brings us back. He pours out unlimited love. He brings us back into His presence to live together in a relationship of love and forgiveness in His church. You know, church, we need to also understand how much God loves you. The Apostle Paul here in a verse that I have known since a child, but it's always just been int very interesting to me that, that, that he said this in Ephesians 3 and verse 8. He says, although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given me. It's always been an interesting verse to me. It's just the humility there. From the Apostle Paul, I am less than the least of all the Lord's people. I have so many questions about that, about that verse. But let me ask you this. Do you think maybe you're the world's worst sinner? 
you might sometimes beat up on yourself and say, you know, Lord, why do you even, why do you even include me in the church? Why, why do you love me? I, I, I try and I fail. I mess up. I do things I know I shouldn't. Man, didn't the, Paul, the Apostle Paul say something similar to that? Why do I do things I don't want to do? <laughs> I hope this morning you'll be able to relate a little bit more to the Apostle Paul in his thinking because I think his thinking is a lot like our thinking. Why do I do things I shouldn't do? He goes, oh, here, I am, I am the, the least of all the Lord's people. And, and then you think maybe you're the world's worst sinner. Well, well, maybe the Apostle Paul has already beat you to that. Stop beating yourself up. Church, we mess up from time to time. Life can be so difficult. By grace, you've been saved. Grace covers you. Live your life well and in obedience and righteousness, but also know you are not perfect and there is no such thing as precision obedience. Take that to the bank. You can't do it. Secondly, you've got to understand how much God loves others and not just your tribe. You also understand God loves people outside of these walls today. That's kind of the level three God story there. True biblical faith moves from level two tribalism where, where most of the world has existed for most of history. And it moves it in both directions. First, down to level one, my story. My personal responsibility before God, the story of, of me becoming aware of my brokenness and emptiness and, and God's gracious acceptance of me anyway. And then it also goes up to level three, the story, God's story, the, real, the realization that God's love goes way beyond my group, way beyond my tribe, the, 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 the people who look and, and believe like me, it goes beyond that. Church, do we sometimes look down upon others as being unworthy of God's love? Who are we looking down upon today? I mean, the Jews did it back then with the Gentiles. Those were just Gentiles. Who are they? Do we do the same thing? I mean, do we, do we look down upon people with addictions? You know, how about the LGBTQ? TQ people. Do we look down upon them? I tell you, this can be earth shattering to a lot of you, and somebody might get up and walk out, but you know, God loves those folks. He does. Every single one of them, He loves. What about Muslims? People follow Islam, Muhammad. He loves them. He loves them. Prisoners? People in jail? Yeah, he loves them too. Homeless folks? You name it. God's going to love them. In church, we don't need to look down upon anyone because lo God loves everyone. He loves us all. We need to have our hearts broken with God's love for all of these people. And until we do, we're just like the self-righteous religionist of the first century who thought they had an exclusive claim on God. God loves everyone. So we're going to close out with what Paul finishes up there in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 17 and 19. And the, I, I oftentimes, most of the time, use the New International Version. Sometimes I use other versions, mainly New International. But on this one, I, this is a New Living Translation. I like the way, I like the way it, it puts it, and I think it's, it's very correct in the way it does. Verses 17 through 19 of Ephesians 3. May your roots 
go down deep into the marvelous soil of God's love. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep His love really is. May you experience the love of Christ. Though it is so great, you will never fully understand it. Wow. That's the Apostle Paul said it. It is so great, you will never fully understand it. And you will be filled with the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Church, let me tell you, when we begin to understand the depth of God's love toward others, we will experience the fullness of God's life and His power. We're going we're gonna to stop there today. We'll continue next week with our study of Ephesians. We're going to we're gonna have an invitation, as we do every week out of tradition. But it's an invitation that if you need to respond to, to the Lord today, if you need to become a Christian, if you need to come back to the Lord, you can do that. But as our members here know, I also always tell you, look, you don't have to come down this aisle. You can get with me later and get with one of the elders later. If you need to talk, need to pray, if you need to be baptized, you do, don't have to come down this aisle. But you can if you want to. We also, one of our elders, Roger Holloway and his wife Shirley, are going to go back to our conference room. If you'd like to go back there for prayer, uh, you're welcome to walk back there. It's just as you go through the foyer on the right, you can go back there and they'll be glad to pray with you, pray for you, whatever we can do. To our guests... Thank you for being here. You, we are your church while you're down here. You have our bulletin. Our phone number's in there. You call us if you need us. My phone number, my cell number's in there, my email. You call me if there's something I can do for you. Um, we're, we're, we're here for you. We're here for you. We're, we're part of the same family. We love you guys. We are grateful that you are here with us today. And, uh, you know, come back next week if you're still in town. Or just call your place of employment, tell them you quit. You're going to stay down here, God's country. <laughs> this morning, oh wait, one last thing. We, we are grateful that you're here. And, you know, we have a couple of folks getting married this next week is what I hear. Uh, I ain't going to tell you who they are, but they're on this side over here and in the back. But <laughs> I'm not going to put them on the spot, but we're grateful for them, and we want to wish them many years of, of marital bliss. We're grateful for them being here and coming to worship God on this Sunday before they get married. So this morning, if any of you have need of the Lord's invitation, we invite you to come right now while together we stand and while we sing.